G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. In this video we're going to talk about the future of the lubricants industry in a post-fossil fuel age. So we'll talk about why we use fossil fuels in the first place, um, what the alternatives might be, as well as what's kind of the likely outcome for the industry. Alright, so um, first up we need to establish the fact that fossil fuels are completely essential to the modern economy. You're probably already aware of that, but I'd like to highlight a couple of ways in which you might not be aware. So it all starts off with fuel, and obviously um, fossil fuels are the predominant driver behind basically anything that moves. So even dis if we discount coal and we look predominantly at the crude oil products and natural gases that are involved in the oil and gas industry, it's what drives most trucks, aviation, cars, shipping, basically any transport, as well as a whole bunch of power generation as well. So that's kind of the, the bedrock on which we build everything. Now, I'm not a kind of a fossil fuel evangelist or an apologist or anything like that. I'm just going to highlight how essential it is to the modern economy. So an offshoot of the um, you know, fuels industry is the chemicals industry. So you're probably pretty aware of this, the fact that, for example, the plastics industry is completely dependent on crude oil refinery. So if you think of polyethylene, for example, ethylene gas comes from the fuels industry um, and the refining industry, and of course, when it's polymerized, we can turn it into all kinds of different plastics. Then you've got the you know paints and adhesives, right? That industry also comes off, um, you know, has its underpinnings in crude oil. Then we've got something like the detergent industry, as well as rubbers, you know, things like tires and, and obviously rubber duckies. And um, the co cosmetics industry as well, um, beauty products, um, cleaning chemicals, um, also a lot of uh, chemicals for the medical industry as well. So all of these tie back to uh, the crude oil markets and are an essential um, you know, crude oil underpins all of these technologies. Then you've got the technologies that maybe you are kind of aware of, but maybe are not directly in your consciousness on a day-to-day -day basis. So think about um, agriculture. Think about uh, modern-day farming. Now, modern-day farmers are truly one of the most uh, productive people who have ever existed in human civilization. Uh, their output is just second to none, and it has mostly been driven by two things mechanization right so um you know going from having to till the land with hands and with animals to be able to use large machines to do it for us right that is driven by the fossil fuel industry but also more directly crop yields have been improved by the use of nitrogen fertilizers so one thing you may not be aware of um, if you're not too into biology is that there are some plants that fix nitrogen into the soil. These tend to be beans, legumes, things like that. And there are some um, plants that can only draw nitrogen from the soil. Corn is a really good example of this. Now, nitrogen is an essential building block of amino acids and therefore proteins. And so you can't really grow plants without nitrogen, right? So we have come up with artificial ways of putting nitrogen in the soil by using nitrogen fertilizers. Where do you go get those nitrogen fertilizers? They predominantly come from the natural gas industry. So we take something like a methane molecule, which is CH4, and with a catalytic converter, we react it with the nitrogen in the air to make um, an ammonia-based fertilizer. So ammonia is NH3. That has vastly improved crop yields all over the world. Um, and so that industry is underpinned by crude oil as well. Then you've got sulfur-based fertilizers also essential to modern day agriculture. And a lot of um, sulfur is actually a byproduct of the refining industry. So, you know, sulfur is considered largely a contaminant in crude oil. So high sulfur crude oils are undesirable. And we remove the sulfur as part of the refining process. And it usually gets sent to, you know, the fertilizer industry for use. All right, now let's take one step out further. Another product which is, you know, comes off um, the oil and gas markets but you may not be aware of, is actually helium. So helium is what I would consider to be the, the last truly non-renewable resource in this world. Everything else is renewable, but at a price point, right? So you use it, 
And in order to recover it and reuse it, it would just be very, very expensive. Helium is non-renewable in the sense that as it's released to atmosphere, it escapes Earth's atmosphere and can never be retrieved. Now, how is helium formed? Well, it's generally formed by the degradation of radioactive isotopes underground. So if you have some thorium deposits, for example, it'll start to give off helium as it decays. Um, and so we find helium trapped generally in um, underground deposits, and it's manufactured as a byproduct of making natural gas. Helium is essential in the medical industry because um, uh, liquid helium is used to cool MRI machines, and it's also used as part of um, some rocket fuels. Um, it's also obviously used in party balloons, and um, the other thing it does, which is maybe more important than party balloons, is that it um, is essential to our understanding of the universe because it plays a large role in the Large Hadron Collider. All right, so now that we've established the role that crude oil plays in all these different um, economies, we can see the scale of the problem. Because if we want to move to an, to an age where crude oil is no longer used for all these different purposes, then all these different industries are going to have to find alternatives. Now, that's not to say it's impossible. Far from it. It's just that there's going to have to be a lot of innovation which occurs in the next 20 to 30 years to wean ourselves off crude oil. All right, so now let's talk about lubricants. We've got a lubricant supply chain, which is dependent, as we've talked about before, on base oils and additives. Now, additives is part of the chemical supply chain, so again, it has its roots in crude oil. But base oil is the one that we can most easily link to the crude oil markets. Now, one of the things that we know about base oils is that they start off their life as crude oil, and they go into the refining process. Now, why this is important is that um, fuel demand is what drives the economics of lubricants. So you need about 11 barrels of crude oil to make one barrel of lubricant base oil, right? Because not all of it is usable as lubricant base oil. And the flexibility of crude oil and the fact that it can make so many different products is one of the things that makes it very appealing. One of the other things that makes it appealing is that we have built this kind of global supply chain that is sort of Pin, underpins the fossil fuel industry. Um, refining uh, or re refineries are all over the world, and that makes them in, an indispensable part of the global supply chain. But it also means that lubricants can be produced all over the world. So, what does this say about you know any of the substitutes that we would want to bring in? Well, in an ideal world, if we want to substitute um, crude oil-based lubricants for something else, firstly, it needs to have good lubricating properties. We also need it to be plentiful and abundant because we use a lot of lubricant every year. Um, it needs to suit existing supply chains in an ideal world. We wouldn't want to have to reconfigure all our refining and supply chains for an alternate technology. And we'd like something that can be easily modified. So something which can um, be modified for the application and can be modified, let's say, for example, through a wide viscosity range, just as um, current lubricant base oils are. Okay, so what are the alternatives? Let's, let's try and dream up some practical alternatives. And the first is just to continue using um, crude oil-based lubricants. That is, you know, a, a reasonable option. The only thing about this is that the economics of refining these days is totally underpinned by fuel demand. We saw this, um, you know, if you haven't watched the video on, you know, where is all the lubricant in 2020, a, 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 dis a destruction in demand for fuel has huge impacts on lubricant supply because the two are so interlinked. So if we no longer had fuel demand because everyone had moved to EVs and hydrogen vehicles, but we still want to make crude oil-based lubricants, we would now be extracting crude oil out of the ground essentially just to make lubricants. And that would massively drive up the cost of, um, of lubricants. Okay, so that is... Uh, I guess a feasible option, but very expensive. The second option is to find some kind of uh, analogous alternate. So uh, uh, a hydrocarbon, because we know that that works, but a hydrocarbon that's sourced from somewhere else. And the first way is to have some kind of like plant-based um, hydrocarbon. We've tried this with biofuels, and generally 
um, you would look to something like a vegetable oil. Now, there are vegetable oil lubricants on the market. Um, they're often used, for example, in uh, the food and beverage industry. But there, there are a couple of issues with it. First, very low oxidative stability, so they don't tend to last as long. There's also issues with actually um, planting, let's say, for example, a palm plantation in order to get palm oil. Firstly, it's a monocrop, so that's not great from a biodiversity standpoint. But also there's land use issues. Often, it, um, you know, in order to plant a, a, a palm plantation, deforestation occurs, right? So that's not great from an environmental uh, standpoint. Or you're taking up land that could otherwise be used for farming, right? So um, that was an issue that came up with biofuels. Finally, it's not... Um, that flexible a platform. So vegetable oils or palm oils or plant-derived oils tend to have a pretty narrow viscosity range. It's not like crude-based oils where you can have something very thin right through to, let's say, open gear lubricants, which are, um, you know, thicker than honey. All right, so one of the alternatives that's been proposed is crude oil that is made by algae, right? So there's a bit of research that's going into this, um, um, it, it's basically a genetic engineering exercise, trying to engineer algae such that when they photosynthesize, they, ex they take uh, a carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and they excrete a crude oil-like substance. Now, that sounds extremely promising, and some of the genetic tools uh, that are being researched are, are looking very promising. The problem is that there is a pretty decent time horizon on these things, and that technology is ultimately untested, and at the moment it's not scalable. So um, if, if we could get a crude oil-like substance out of this algae, it would be ideal because you could put it into existing refineries. But at the moment, it doesn't look like if that's going to work out. All right, so what about a non-crude oil solution? Something kind of like a, a synthetic molecule. Well, one of the things that's looking a little bit promising are ionic fluids. You might say, what on earth is an ionic fluid? Um, so there was a lot of research in these in sort of like the early 2000s. Looked very promising. Uh, some of the research has died off a little bit, but it's making a bit of a comeback. So what are they? All right, you can take an asymmetric organic cation and an inorganic anion. That probably means just about nothing to you. Um, effectively, what you can think of them as is a, is a molten salt. So a salt that stays liquid at the temperatures that you operate at. Right? Um, so what would an organic cation and an inorganic anion look like? Well, um, let's say, for example, with um, the ammonium analog. So you have nitrogen um, in, the, in the core of it, and you have alkyl groups um, off it. Or um, I think it's called a, a tetrafluoroborate. Right, would be another example. And that's kind of an analogue to boron trifluoride. So what you can do is you can tailor these molecules for the properties that you want. So with the inorganic anion, for example, um, you know, a boron-based tetrafluoride would have properties similar to boron antiwear and antioxidant molecules. You could substitute the boron for um, you know, sulfur, for example, if you wanted an EP-style um, product. Or, or phosphorus if you wanted some kind of anti-wear. So there's a lot of uh, flexibility in the platform, but it, it requires a lot more research. What are the downsides of this technology? Well, at the moment, it is reasonably untested, although there's a lot of research going in in this area. Um, it's not scalable, again, uh, and it wouldn't use the existing refinery supply chain. Some of the chemistries have been found to be hydrophilic, so they take on a lot of water, but I suspect with a lot more research, we could get around this. And in some cases, because they take on so much water, they call they cause what's called, you know, tribocorrosion. And so we have corrosion issues with with uh, uh, the equipment that they're in. So again, a lot more research required in this area, but it is looking reasonably promising. All right, so what's the likely outcome? And sorry to spoil the party, I have no idea. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to make projections projections for the next you know, 10, 20, 30 years, uh, and there's a lot of research that can be done in between now and then. Uh, a particular interest of mine is to look at um, you know, organic manufacturing, where people are literally um, you know, building new molecules from 
effectively DNA, right? Uh, and so that's looking really promising. And so who knows what the technology looks like in 20 to 30 years time. Ultimately, we are going to have to come up with some kind of alternative, though, if we want to get away from crude oil um, refining and production. So I guess watch this space. The good thing is lubricants are still going to be necessary. So long as machinery is turning um, and it's moving, we're going to need some kind of lubrication. Um, now, there are some self-lubricated bearings that are starting to come up and a lot of advances in material science. But for the foreseeable future, liquid lubricants are, are the answer. So anyway, slightly different video today, um, looking forward. And um, as usual, if you've got questions or comments, which I hope there's going to be quite a few, um, leave them below. Otherwise, this has been Lubrication Explained.